I need to tell you all a story. Last year, a woman by the name of Jordan Bellamire was sexually assaulted in virtual reality. She was playing a video game with a system comprised of a headset, which she could use to look around, and a motion controller in each hand, which she could use to reach out and interact. The game system was able to superimpose an avatar onto her body, a body which corresponded to her real one. Another player came up to Miss Bellamire and reached for her breasts, her groin. Later, in an interview, she described the feeling of violation as her husband and brother-in-law watched. The feeling of that reality encroaching on this one. Take a second. Imagine looking down on a body that looks just the way you look, that moves when you move. And imagine watching someone touch and manipulate that body. My name is Edmund King, and I study law here at Maastricht University. I wanted to know what this story meant. I can tell you now, there was no crime committed, but there was harm. There was no crime committed because we don't have fully developed rules for dealing with this kind of situation. That is because virtual reality is a technology unlike anything that has come before. In the case of printed media, the sensory experience of the consumer is for the most part internalized. Visual media allows us to witness things we could not imagine. Yet, we still have context. We know that what is happening is happening on a screen because we're able to contextualize and separate the images from the realities of our homes or movie theaters. Virtual reality erodes that context. This gives it amazing potential. Already it's being used by doctors to help correct lazy eyes, by psychologists to help treat people for post-traumatic stress disorders and phobias. Educators are able to give their students experiences that would be impossible otherwise. We rely on our senses to gain knowledge and information about the world around us. As technology improves, those same senses make less and less of a distinction between realities. We are immersed in a world which is different from the one we inhabit in this moment. So imagine the difference in sensation between pressing a button to shoot someone on a screen or having to stand over your victim move to pull out a weapon, aim, and actually pull the trigger. That experience is bundled together with pretty much every other form of visual media. Games are games, movies are movies. They can be accessed just as easily and created just as freely, despite the fact that the elevated sensory experience is different. Around the world, our system of regulating access is primarily concerned with limiting the liability of retailers at the point of physical sale. So, theoretically, a child can't walk into a shop and buy mature-rated content over the counter. It makes sense. But online, all any of us have to do is tick a box. This offers very little in the way of real protection, real safeguards, a fractured system which doesn't take into account the homogeny of an open internet. Until now, that has been enough, but moving forward, we might need more. Let's go back to Miss Bellamy's story. We know how she accessed the game. She wasn't a child. Who made it possible? Another conversation we might have is whether it is ethical to create these experiences in such detail. Currently, the authors of media are, to a greater extent, protected by their freedoms of expression. That hasn't stopped governments across the world banning certain games and movies. But once again, there's no distinction between virtual reality and regular content. This leaves gaps in the law as we try to apply existing norms to an evolving situation. Some will ask why a willing consumer 
should not be able to simulate a violent experience. Is this not over-regulation? Indeed, a theoretical economic demand for simulated bloodshed might well be representative of an emerging societal norm, of acceptance. The thing is, outside of well, the military and certain controlled sporting environments, violence is for the most part discouraged, if not illegal. Is allowing the additional element of the physicality of VR to become mainstream overly desensitizing? I have younger brothers, and both of them are fully embracing different types of media and technology into their lives as they grow up. Joshua, who's the youngest, he's still getting to grips with an iPad, but Robert, who is 14, finished building his first computer over the summer. If I think about their relationship to technology compared to mine at their age, it's almost inconceivable that we're part of the same generation. It's equally inconceivable to consider the additional risks that they're exposed to. We also need to talk about choice. The difference between virtual reality and real life is that you or I engaging in any virtual activity is a question of choice. The problem is that increasingly it isn't. It isn't realistically feasible to exist without an email or not to partake in social media. It's possible, but often debilitating. Recently, Finland became the first country to grant to its citizens as a right access to broadband internet. Everyone in this room has certain rights online, not to have information stolen, not to be bullied, but Miss Bellemeyer did not have the right to be treated any differently. At what point do we accept that the inherent risk, the potential harm, is so great in an immersive environment that we need clearly defined rules. Virtual actions have all too real consequences. At what point do we acknowledge that what happened to Ms. Bellamy could happen to so many others and go unpunished? Virtual reality expands the intimacy with which we can interact online. Inevitably, as we go forward, it will become necessary. But that's the beauty. That's the beauty of virtual reality. I'm a huge proponent of making this technology mainstream. I'm excited, and I know that when it is, we will all be better off, and it will act as a force for connecting the world. This is the future, ladies and gentlemen. But we can only do that by building a cultural and legal platform. I'm not a professor. I'm not an expert. I'm not here to answer the questions that I've raised today. We have to do that together. Whether virtual content needs to have narrower access online, whether developers can create freely, whether we need to have clearly defined rights to guarantee a safe space for everyone. Information and debate are the most valuable things we can have right now. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many different ways of looking at what Jordan Bellamy's story means. This talk is about awareness of our evolving situation. We've solved problems like this in the past. The creation of the internet, the rise of social media, ever more closely integrated personal computers. We will solve the problems of VR now. The sooner we do, the sooner we can start really protecting people and really using this technology, what it is meant for, and to its full potential. Thank you.